First, Wayne Carey. Then, Andre Agassi. Now comes the most explosive sports expose of the year. Rob Perella, bowls and all. Former Commonwealth Games Lawn Bowls champion Rob Perella lifts the lid on his days at the top. The drugs, the parties, the women, all the dizzying highs. Superb bowling again from Rob Perella. And crushing lows. Yeah, no, just, just passes it. Finally, the truth about Australian lawn bowls. Rob Perella, bowls and all. True stories from the gutter. Out now for Christmas. Tonight on Hungry Beast, refugee stories of coming to Australia. You know, to have Australian friends was not easy to make. Part two of our A to Z of fake things that really exist. Mini Kiss weren't made for loving you, but these love dolls were. And why is this man getting vaccinated to prevent cervical cancer? It's your week remixed. But first, how to give a newspaper a boob job? Hi. You may have noticed there's a bit of a difference between our daily newspapers and their online counterparts. For example, the front page of The Age on Monday was all about the weather and climate change, but The Age Online had a slightly different take on the day. Australian Idol, strip clubs, the sex industry, red carpets, schoolies and bikinis, bikini-clad baristas, and not one but four separate links to the Victoria's Secret fashion show in New York City. Yeah, if there's one thing online news sites love more than celebrity gossip, it's sex. Because sex means clicks, and clicks mean cash. Think about it. Why just run a story about Nicole Kidman when you can run a story about Nicole Kidman's breasts? <laughs> and here's a very serious piece from the Sydney Morning Herald Online about Hillary Clinton being confirmed as the US Secretary of State. Right next to the best of the breasts. <laughs> it's hard to believe that Fairfax Digital boss Jack Matthews used to work at Playboy. I swear, I only read The Age Online for the articles. It makes you wonder, what would it be like to work at a daily news website? Hmm. OK, people, what do we got? Well, interest rates Next. are gone. A Labor MP got sacked. Was she hot? It was a man. Come on, people, we want news. Who's covering the cycling protest in Israel? It's in Israel. Why do we care? I care because the cyclists are nude. Come on, people, tits get clicks. What else? What about a Kevin Rudd feature? Has he got boobs? No, but give me a second. You! Uh, Pink Ribbon Day? Yes. Breast cancer? Breasts, yes, but not as we need them. What else? Um, there was a drug raid in Brisbane. Big? Yeah, huge. Australia's biggest bust. Great work, people. We're making news here. What else? Guys, there's been an earthquake in East Timor. Oh, come on. Everyone's going to be covering it. Give me a second. Earthquake, tsunami, beach, sunbake, caught by surprise, topless boobs, top of the homepage, run it, and that too. Stuff said this week. Nothing tastes as good as skinny feels. Kate Moss, who's been accused of encouraging eating disorders in teenage girls after claiming she lives by this pro anorexia motto. Guardian.co.uk, November 20th, 2009. Back in my day, we didn't cyber bully. We had the work ethic to bully people in person. <laughs> Australian writer Ben Pobgy on the banality of microblogging website Twitter. Thepunch.com.au, November 18th, 2009. The fact is that we can't account for the lack of warming at the moment, and it's a travesty we can't. Kevin Trenberth, climatologist at the US Centre for Climate Research. One of thousands of emails from Britain's Climate Research Unit leaked by hackers. The Australian, November 23rd. 2009. Beware fake Paralympians. On the weekend it was announced athletes with learning disabilities would be allowed to compete in the Paralympics for the first time since 2000, when members of the gold medal winning Spanish Paralympian basketball team were revealed to have faked having intellectual disabilities so they could compete. 
The truth is humans love to fake things. In tribute, here now, part two in our A to Z of fake things that really exist. This is the Hungry Beast A to Z of fake, part two, I to Q. I is for idiot. It's also for injury. In April, London rugby player Tom Williams was given a fake blood capsule and told to feign injury, so his team who were losing could substitute the top goal kicker back on the field. Former England coach Dick Best revealed, these blood capsules have been used extensively for years. What a performance. Someone give this guy an Oscar. From sports stars to pop stars, here's J-Lo, nude. Well, not really. This website has photos of naked chicks with J-Lo's head photoshopped onto them. Sorry, guys. But if you're feeling ripped off, imagine how fans of glam rockers Kiss felt when they came across this. Not Kiss, but Mini Kiss, a Kiss cover band made up of midgets. Mini Kiss weren't made for loving you, but these love dolls were. They even have artificial skeletons to allow for anatomically correct positioning. So creepy. A bit like fake meat. The leading brand for fake meat products worldwide is a patented fungus called corn, which has a structure similar to animal muscle cells. Patented fungus. Wow, that's still not as bad as tofu. And now to a freaky hoax. In June 2007, a Czech TV weather report had viewers panicking when it showed a live nuclear blast. Hackers spliced a mushroom cloud into the broadcast as part of an art project on media reality. Despite facing three years jail for their stunt, they won the Young Artist Prize from the Prague National Gallery. From the end of the world to the most powerful man in the world, or is it? Barack Obama is the latest president to be added to Madame Tussaud's Wax Museum. And to complete the set, here's our Kev. Oh, that's real. Speaking of President Obama, fake protesters turned up to disrupt his health reform talks in the US. It's a form of propaganda known as astroturfing, where companies like Philip Morris and Shell fund fake grassroots movements to influence the political landscape. Who knew tobacco and oil companies could be unscrupulous? But if you think that's sus, check this. A fake quadriplegic. In May, Timothy Ling was sentenced to 20 years in prison after pretending to be paralysed from the neck down. Over two years, he scammed more than 200 grand in social security and medical payments. On the positive side, it was very easy to arrest. If you reckon that's as low as fake can go, wait till our final instalment of The Hungry Beast A to Z of Fake, coming up next week. In all the recent media coverage of Mike Rand's alleged affair with a waitress, no one's asking the really important question. Who cares? Whatever did slash didn't happen, it was six years ago. Mike Rand wasn't married, and even she's not saying it affected his work. And at the very end, when it was finished, you know, it was almost like, OK, I, you know, I have a meeting now. I have to go. See, he even kept his meetings. Why do we give a toss what or who he does during his lunch break? The only way this could possibly qualify as news is if Rand supposedly misused government property by shagging on the Premier's desk. If anything, though, that would have helped his work ethic. Who isn't a little bit more productive after a good shag? Mike Rand should be left alone for our sake. See, every time you attack a politician for a sex scandal, we have to read about them having sex. And then, whether you like it or not, we have to imagine them having sex. So please, let's put this issue to bed. When the Christopher Pine sex story threatens to break, you'll thank me. Media coverage of Mike Rand's sex life? It's a little bit bullshit. In a week when there's been a refugee riot on Christmas Island, there's been no shortage of opinion and questions about asylum seekers. Will they be a burden? Will they fit in? Will they take our jobs? Australia has a long tradition of taking in refugees from conflicts such as World War II and the Vietnam War. So we spoke to three refugees from three different waves of boat arrivals about their experience of resettling in Australia. My name is Abdul Karim Hikmat. I am from Afghanistan. I came by a board in 2001. Olga Horak and I came to Australia in 1949, emigrating from Czechoslovakia. My name is uh, Hung Nguyen. I escaped from Vietnam. Uh, I am a refugee. Only the young people survived in Auschwitz. And for me, a home which could not protect me, 
is very hard to accept today. When the communists took over the whole country in 1975, I became a stateless person. The Taliban actually uh, persecuted a lot of minority groups, and that was the reason that I left Afghanistan. And no choice. I got to go, got out of Vietnam. There was a kind of mass uh, migration. Hundreds of refugees a day went to Iran. And just a few came to Australia. It was quite a risky journey, so we had to, we had to take that risk. To get the passport was impossible. If you didn't have connections, you had to flee. I was hiding in the house until midnight. I got on the small boat. It was quite dark, and we had to kind of crawl on other people's body to get in. It was overcrowded, and I was desperately seasick. No room for you to sit, a lower deck and upper deck, or full. We had about seven this travel from Indonesian island to Ashmorif. On the fifth or sixth day, there's nothing left, no water, no any other things. And the boat was actually leaky for about two or three days. I left all behind. I left my mother behind. That's the big thing in my life. Yeah, it was, it was a terrible journey. I didn't know much about it, Australia. At the Brisbane Anglican Church, people received me and gave me five dollars. I didn't know how to use that. And then they say, how are you, mate? <laughs> we came to Sydney. My husband was a textile engineer, although his degree was not acknowledged here. And I, I was not trained to be anything, but I improvised. When we got to the detention center, there was no TV, no newspaper. And one day, actually, I asked one of the guards, if you finish the newspaper, could you please give it to me and I read it? And he said, no, you can't. You are not allowed to read anything. It was very hard to get a job. You need to learn the language. So I left 5 o'clock in the morning and walked to the factory and I went to English class until 9.30, 10 o'clock. You know, to have Australian friends was not easy to make. Our neighbors were Australian people, and I often, you know, saw the man with binoculars in the window watching us, what we were doing. Coming as a, as a refugee, Australia has provided a lot of opportunities for me, though this opportunity did not come easily. I don't accept that view that as refugees are a burden. Most of the people that I know, they work very hard in Australia. They come in here penniless, no money. That's more motivated them to work hard and also contribute to the Australian societies. After two weeks here, we were taxpayers. We, we had a business, we had a factory, and we employed at a certain stage about 90 people. We were not um, given any assistance by the government, and I'm proud of that fact. You have to make positive out of negative situation. And you have to try to work hard to counter these negative things said about refugees. I was eager to be accepted. And we were eager to create a new home. It, it was a challenge, a real challenge. I have done what I have liked to do. I make a difference to my life, which I couldn't do back home. No one wants to leave their own countries, right? Unless they're very desperate for people. To be on the boat to Australia is, is a... can't believe it. There are people ready to work hard to contribute to Australia, and they are, they're human. The, the refugee people is... they're not terrorists. They're looking for somewhere to live.
we'd like to say a very big thank you to Olga, Hung and Abdul for giving us their stories. We're also opening up the Hungry Beast website tonight for a live forum because we'd like to know what you think about Australia's approach to refugees. Hung Nguyen and Abdul Karim Hekmat will both be online for an hour after the show. So head to the website and have your say in the forum at abc.net.au slash hungrybeast. Of course, we can't be sure that all refugees are coming to Australia with the best of intentions. How do we guard against this potential threat to our way of life? With award-winning journalism. As a nation, we've upheld a proud tradition of being anti-foreigners. It's what our heroic digger heroes died for at Gallipoli. But right now, Australia is under invasion. Approximately billions of hopeless foreigners are travelling in high-speed boats toward our shores, hoping to steal our jobs, food and women. That's bad, but what's worse is they're all frauds. They say they're seeking asylum, but only a few years ago we placed them in conditions similar to an asylum and they complained. They say Sri Lanka is a war-torn country, but if it's so bad, why are good Sri Lankans like cricketer Kumar Sangakkara happy to stay there? For some answers, I spoke to a bearded man. Hello. Hopefully this interview Hi. will make you cry. Why are you fleeing your country? Uh, I had to leave my country because uh, my country is a very dangerous Stop. place. Stop. I can't understand what he's saying. Is it... Off the record, he confessed he didn't know who Don Bradman was. And his urine sample was cloudy. Oh. With such suspicious behaviour, the question is, don't come here. Either way, they should count themselves lucky to have been on a boat. Not even a lot of Australians can afford a sea vessel like this one, but at $69,000, now you can. Just boats is more than just boats. The 28-year-old had just arrived from Papua New Guinea after completing the Kokoda track. But Jetstar staff forced him to check in his wheelchair as luggage, offering him an alternative which he couldn't operate. That is a sad reminder of the humiliating treatment so many disabled people are forced to put up with on a daily basis. Jetstar says its service for wheelchair-bound customers is efficient and dignified, is standard industry practice and it hasn't received a formal complaint. The Paralympic champion was offered an alternative wheelchair that can't be self-propelled and chose to crawl instead. Sunrise, brought to you by Jetstar. During the OneTel trial, Lachlan Murdoch answered, I can't recall, or something similar, 881 times. The Australian. The International Cloud Appreciation Society have nominated a new cloud known as Undulatus Aspiratus for membership in the International Cloud Atlas. The last cloud admitted to the Atlas was in 1951. Time magazine. Fuel from dismantled nuclear weapons, including Russian nuclear bombs, provides 10% of America's electricity, which is more than hydropower, solar, biomass, wind and geothermal combined. The New York Times. Cervical cancer claims the lives of more than 200 Australian women each year. But thankfully, we're fighting to reduce its impact. In 2007, the federal government began making the cervical cancer vaccine, Gardasil, free for women aged 18 to 26. The scheme wraps up at the end of the year, and while it's been a success, there are still heaps of women who haven't been vaccinated. But there is a way you can help those who have fallen through the cracks. To show you how, here's Daniel Keogh. All right, now some of you might be thinking, but Daniel, you don't have a cervix. What's the point? Well, the point is that I care about your cervix. 
You see, Gardasil isn't a vaccine against cancer. It's a vaccine against the human papillomavirus, a sexually transmitted infection that causes cancer. But it doesn't only infect women. Over three quarters of us will get some variety of it in our lifetime. There's currently no way for guys to test whether they have HPV, so you're never going to know when you're passing it on to someone. But when a woman finds out that she has cervical cancer, which happens to roughly two Australian women every day, it was caused by HPV, which was given to her by a guy. So isn't it about time that we took responsibility for that? By vaccinating against HPV, you're making sure that you aren't passing it on to your future girlfriend, wife or casual fuck buddy. Plus, there's even benefits for you as well. HPV can give you genital warts, which are pretty unattractive and can be really painful when you have to burn them off your dick. Studies from the University of Melbourne have shown that the shot can protect you from getting them. HPV also causes cancer there too, which, yes, is freaking rare, but not really something you want to get. Plus, if you're a guy who's bi or gay and you're on the receiving end of anal sex, then it's seriously worth considering because HPV-related anal cancer is just as frequent for you guys as cervical cancer is in girls. Finally, if you're using your mouth for more than just talking in bed, then it's been suggested by professionals that it may help prevent throat cancer too. Yes, for us guys, the shot is freaking expensive, particularly when women 18 to 26 were getting the shots for free. Which is a bit shit, really. It's kind of sending the message that looking after your sexual health is a responsibility solely for women. But if you're a guy who's straight or gay, and you're at all interested in protecting yourself against warts, penile cancer, anal cancer and potentially throat cancer, and you're not that keen on giving the future love of your life cervical cancer, then think about getting a shot of Gardasil. I did. If you're thinking about getting vaccinated, whether you're a guy or a girl, have a chat to your doctor. And there's heaps more info about the benefits of Gardasil for guys on our website. One million US dollars. The amount Nicolas Cage has spent on comic book purchases. Cage is currently suing his business manager for $20 million and has said he is on the path to financial ruin. $73 billion. The amount of unpaid overtime Australians work every year. It adds up to two billion hours worth. 326 million US dollars. The amount one ex-smoker has won in damages from tobacco manufacturer Philip Morris. There have been 8,000 suits filed since 2006 in Florida alone. Just before we go, a very big thanks to all of you who joined up on our website and uploaded your own videos. They're great but we can't post many of them because they're filled with copyrighted music and images which we can't use without permission. So if you want to see your work on the web and on the TV show, please make sure you only use sound images and music you made. Because then you could end up in a fancy package just like this. This is stuff you made, created from stories you posted on the Hungry Beast website. Hungry Beast member Craig Fox shares an interview with Lance, a cancer victim who uses marijuana for medicinal purposes. So, sometimes overnight, I will roll myself a joint and I'll put on some music and relax the best way I know how. Become a member of Hungry Beast online and share your ideas and video stories with us at abc.net.au slash hungrybeast. That's it for the show. Don't forget we're on the web in moments with the forum about Australia's approach to refugees with Hung Nguyen and Abdul Hekmat. If you'd like to join the discussion or put questions to Hung and Abdul, go to abc.net.au forward slash hungrybeast. We'll see you there. Good, Good night. night. Next week on Hungry Beast, we investigate how the proposed reduction in Olympic funding is forcing athletes into new jobs. All things very well, we should be able to meet our targets in May next year. Come on, mate. We spoke about this. Good one, Robin, you dickhead.
we cover an important government announcement. The federal government have added the following people to its list of Australia's most untrusted. People with moustaches, people who hold a long wink, people with towels on their heads, and people who smell their own fingers. And we join every other media outlet by celebrating the end of the noughties with a top ten list. 2003, what were we thinking? <laughs> 2007, wah wah. Oh my god, 2008? What about that hair? Oh, the Kiwis, they go 2006 and it was like, ah, <laughs> you said sex. <laughs> <laughs> Come on! <laughs> 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 Yeah, I mean, that was a year. That was definitely a year. That's next week on Hungry Beast.